So for this lecture, we will cover paniculitis. So before you can understand paniculitis, you have to understand lobules of subcutaneous fat and the fibrous septum. So if you notice where the greatest inflammation is, whether it's in the septum or whether it's in the fat lobule, you'll be able to categorize these paniculitis. And so these paniculitides are usually purely septal or purely lobular, but in reality, they can show mixed features. Uh, for learning purposes and for test purposes, though, you should know which ones are more septal and which ones are more lobular in terms of the um, inflammatory pattern. So this is a challenging area of dermatopathology and in real life, inadequate biopsies, many times they will leave out the subcutis. And so it's difficult. Um, if there's a punch biopsy and they're looking for a paniculitis and there's no fat to look at, then you can't rule out or rule in a paniculitis. So it's very important to get the fat if you're uh, suspecting a paniculitis. Many times you can do a punch biopsy and then do a punch right into that hole and do a punch within a punch procedure to get that fat deeper down within the punch biopsy space. You can also just do an excisional wedge biopsy or incisional, depending on the size of the area. So you can subdivide these diseases into more lobular and more septal, as we said. And as I mentioned, most diseases can affect both in real life. Um, so you really have to correlate clinically closely with the scenario to make sure that um, you're increasing your confidence for the diagnosis. So clinically, you'll see deep-seated, variably tender, painful nodules on the lower extremities, just kind of depending on what it is. And we'll go over each individual paniculitis so that you can see examples. So on the left, you have mostly a septal paniculitis here. The inflammation is traveling along the septa, and you're getting some kind of spillage into the lobule. Whereas with lobular paniculitis, you mostly have inflammation within the fat lobules themselves and not really tracking as much along the septic. So the basic septal paniculitides include without vasculitis or with vasculitis. The most common septal paniculitis that you should know is erythema nodosum without vasculitis. You can have other types of paniculitides that are usually not presenting without vasculitis. Those include scleroderma, nephrobiosis lipoidica, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, and ruptured cysts oftentimes are septal in terms of the paniculitis. With uh, septal inflammation and vasculitis, particularly large and medium vessels, you can see this in polyarteritis nodosa as well as migratory thrombophlebitis. So the basic patterns of lobular paniculitis, again, without and with vasculitis, there's most of the paniculitides are lobular paniculitides without vasculitis. So you can see pancreatic paniculitis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency paniculitis, lupus erythematosus profundus, or lupus paniculitis, as it's known as. We're mentioning here subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, not because it's a paniculitis per se, it's actually a, a malignancy, but we're putting it here because it can be very difficult to tell with the differential diagnosis between lupus profundus and some other lobular paniculitides. So for the purposes of the lecture, we're just including it here. Subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, sclerema neonatorum, sclerosing paniculitis or lipodermatosclerosis and dermatomyositis paniculitis. And we'll go over examples of all of these. And then a lobular inflammation pattern with vasculitis. You can have smaller or larger vessels involved. Erythema endurotum is the one you should know. It's also known as nodular vasculitis. And calciphylaxis actually can present with a lobular paniculitis and a secondary vasculitis essentially or rather actually a primary um, vasculopathy caused by calcium, which leads to a secondary vasculitis and then a secondary paniculitis. That's probably more accurate to say. So what are the basic patterns? Again, you can have mixed with and without vasculitis. So if you have trauma to the fat, you can actually cause uh, multiple patterns, including presentation of secondary vasculitis 
Um, however, most of the time it presents without a clear vasculitis. It's mostly just kind of inflammation. If you have cold trauma to the fat, you can get what is called as cold paniculitis. That's kind of another form of traumatic paniculitis. You can also have factitial paniculitis and infectious paniculitis, which we will go over. So septal paniculitis without vasculitis. Let's cover these first. Erythema nodosum is the, the most common. Paniculitis with all comers. Usually you'll see it in young adults. It affects females more than males at a ratio of three to one. With sudden onset red tender nodules. You'll often have a prodrome of fever and malaise. It often presents in the bilateral lower legs. The etiology of erythema nodosum can include multiple things. It, it's kind of like vasculitis, multiple causes of vasculitis, multiple causes of leukocytoclastic vasculitis, right? So it's the same thing with erythema nodosum, multiple causes, whether it be infectious, auto-inflammatory, whether it be um, inflammatory bowel disease, drugs, it could be malignancy, and then many times it's idiopathic. So this is just a list here of some of the more common etiologies of erythema nodosum, uh, but you're going to have to correlate clinically. And oftentimes we're just limited to say, well, it's erythema nodosum and we're caught looking for the exact cause of it. So here at low power, you see septal thickening with lots of inflammation. Again, a septal paniculitis, as well as edema, hemorrhage, neutrophils, and granulomatous inflammation. You can see that the lobules are pretty clean, pretty spared. You can actually see individual adipocytes. Um, it doesn't mean that at the edges, you don't have some lobular type pattern of paniculitis, but holistically, it's primarily septal. Ruptured cysts can have septal paniculitis as well as lobular paniculitis. So make sure you're not dealing with just a single lesion, like a ruptured cyst. Erythema nodosum can have that septal granulomatous inflammation, as I mentioned. So you'll see a lot of giant cells within the septum, so-called Meissner's granulomas here. So Meissner's granuloma often with these um, numerous amounts of giant cells within the septum. You can also see inflammation of the small venules, so venulitis that's often seen in the acute phase. Moving on to lobular paniculitis without vasculitis. Pancreatic paniculitis, one of my favorite diseases. It's, um, it's very cool to look at on histology. As it implies, it's due to pancreatic disease, whether it be acute or chronic pancreatitis with pseudocysts pancreatic tumors, et cetera. So anything that causes leakage of the pancreatic enzymes into the bloodstream can ultimately lead to saponification of the fat, giving you that pattern. Clinically, it presents with multiple tender nodules on the distal extremities, especially the lower extremities, the buttocks and the lower trunk. You see ulceration, oily and chalky drainage material. The etiology is fat digestion by the lipase, amylase, and trypsin that is leaked out of the pancreas. And you're going to see saponification of the fat. So from this power, you can see this really nice lobular paniculitis and these areas of kind of mixture of eosinophilic tone and basophilic tone. There's some amphophilic tone as well. And then you have these really large areas of eosinophilic collections and then a basophilic rim. And this is essentially a process known as saponification. These large um, cells are kind of called ghost cells. They're basically like large adipocytes, but they're filled in with this eosinophilic material with a rim of um, calcification as well as kind of a deeper purple basophilic stain. And so this is um, basically the process of saponification due to the enzymes that have leaked out and then it gives you this draining oily material once it exudes through the skin. Another high image example of pancreatic paniculitis from McKee's textbook. Just again, one of the very fun to look at diagnoses in Dermpath. As I mentioned, the ghost cells, not to be confused with the shadow cells slash ghost cells of a pilometricoma. These are different. Um, one thing that's important is to 
if, if you see a pattern like this, definitely make sure that the patient doesn't have some concurrent infection, especially mucormycosis or rhizopus, et cetera. Dr. Uh, Elson has presented that differential diagnosis at the American Academy of Dermatology meetings. And always remember that um, th this pancreatic paniculitis type pattern can definitely be masquerading a fungal infection in patients with, that are immunosuppressed. So keep that in mind. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, this presents with severe intractable paniculitis starting in the 30s. The etiology, again, is enzymatic digestion of lipid. These patients have recurrent episodes of painful tender nodules that are induced by trauma. You can see them on the trunks and extremities and the buttocks. They may or may not have fever and pulmonary complications. And this inheritance is due to a PIZZ mutation in individuals leading to the paniculitis. So if you see a lobular paniculitis with lots of neutrophils, you have to think about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The other thing you have to think about is an infectious paniculitis. So doing bug stains and doing tissue cultures are going to be important as well. Just another high power view of lobular paniculitis with lots of neutrophils. Lupus paniculitis occurs more in females than males. It can occur in middle-aged patients as well. It's often associated with systemic lupus erythematosus, and you can have concurrent cutaneous lupus, such as discoid lupus as well. It's the most common paniculitis of the upper body, but it can include um, the back as well as the buttocks. You often can see it on the face, scalp, arms, and breasts. It presents with painful sub-Q nodules leading to atrophy or dense sclerosis, and it can recur even in crops, plus or minus some spontaneous resolution. So from low power, you see a lobular paniculitis. It's kind of tracking along the septa, but you have some lobular inflammation. And the important thing is when you see these lymphoid aggregates, this lobular lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, you have to be thinking about lupus paniculitis. Lupus paniculitis is one of those entities that form really dense lymphoid collections like this. And you can see over here a, a pretty convincing lobular uh, pattern. On higher power in between individual adipocytes, you can notice lots in plasma cells as well as histiocytes. Um, so here's your plasma cell. You also have uh, scattered histiocytes, lymphocytes. But keep in mind, if you see lots of plasma cells within that infiltrate, consider a lupus paniculitis. But you're going to want to put it together with the clinical as well as low power lymphoid aggregates within a lobular pattern. Another example of kind of these lymphoid follicles that try to form within these areas of lupus paniculitis. Many times you can see hyalinization of blood vessels as well as the fat, and you can get lipomembranous change as well. Um, so it kind of looks very similar to lipodermatosclerosis in many ways. However, the clinical picture of lipodermatosclerosis is much different than the clinical picture of lupus paniculitis. Here again, lots of hyalinization, some areas of kind of lipomembranous change, as you see here, some lymphoid follicles as well. Um, and I've had cases where there was a debate between lupus paniculitis and lipodomatous sclerosis on biopsy um, because of the lipomembranous change. You really have to take it into account to the, with the clinical picture to get the, the best diagnosis. And so uh, nodules forming in a relatively young person on the extremities that doesn't look anything like lipodermatous sclerosis, it's probably lupus paniculitis. Do an ANA, do some autoimmune workup, et cetera, and try to figure out the, the entire clinical picture. Many times in lupus paniculitis, you can actually see an interface change as you would see in normal cutaneous lupus. You don't always have to have this, but it is helpful when you do find it. Subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma is always in the differential when you see a lobular paniculitis and you can't tell are those cells clonal or not. So 
We discussed this in another lecture, but it's important just to review here for the differential diagnosis. Patients who have subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma can present with a wide age range. The median age is around the mid 40s, presents with erythematous to violaceous nodules and generalized distribution, but often on the limbs and trunk. You can have two forms, either the alpha beta type, which is more benign, and it's considered to be existing on a spectrum with lupus profundus or cutaneous or lupus uh, paniculitis. Gamma delta subtype is considered to be more of a poor prognosis. And I will say that uh, kind of revisions of gamma delta lymphomas consider that all of these are primary. However, primary gamma delta can present mostly as a subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma. And so it's very important to differentiate. Are you dealing with a, an alpha beta type of subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma, which is considered to probably be on a spectrum of lupus profundus, or are you dealing more with a primary gamma delta lymphoma, whether or not it's predominantly subcutaneous and oftentimes gamma delta lymphomas can be more dermal based or even cause epidermal ulceration, et cetera. We'll talk about important stains that can help you differentiate those. Within this primary gamma delta lymphoma, you can see hemophagocytic syndrome in 20% of cases. So from low power, you can see what looks to be a lobular paniculitis. You can see individual adipocytes. There's lots of inflammation in between. And so classically, this is some type of lobular paniculitis-like pattern. However, these are atypical lymphocytes. And if you were to do clonality testing, most likely these would come back as positive for clonality, T cell clonality. Determining whether or not they're predominantly expressing alpha beta TCRs or gamma delta TCRs will be important in terms of the patient prognosis. On high power, you see individual adipocytes that are kind of in single file rimming, so called rimming these adipocytes. But many times it can be difficult to tell, are these truly atypical? Are these truly clonal? And your immunohistochemistry as well as your molecular testing are going to be important to help separate those. Many cases of subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma end up having what are so-called beanbag cells, where these, you have these large phagocytic cells that take in uh, cellular debris, erythrocytes, et cetera. And so it looks like um, a beanbag, essentially. So the alpha beta subtype of subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma is usually positive for CD3 and CD8, as well as granzyme B, TIA1, perforin, and beta F1. Usually though, they're negative for CD4, CD30, CD56, and Epstein-Barr virus expression. The gamma delta subtype of SPTCL, which again, I said is considered now a primary cutaneous gamma delta lymphoma, these are usually CD4 negative. You can see CD8 positive cells within the infiltrate, but usually the malignant cells or the clonal cells are negative. And it's usually negative for beta F1 TCR expression. Conversely, it's CD56 positive usually, as well as TCR gamma delta positive. We've had cases where it looked like a subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, and we did the TCR for Delta, it was super enriched in the neoplastic cells and um, clonality testing uh, would probably be positive in these cases, as long as you have enough tissue to prove it. You have to follow these patients very closely because if it is truly a gamma Delta type of uh, lymphoma, then these patients have a very poor prognosis. On the other hand, lupus paniculitis, which I said can be difficult to distinguish from SPTCL usually has numerous plasma cells and areas of hyalinization, as we talked about, those reactive germinal centers. And if you're lucky, you can see some epidermal involvement as well. That being said, although alpha beta SPTCL usually doesn't involve the epidermis, if it's a TCR gamma delta type, it can involve the epidermis, especially if it's a primary gamma delta. Uh, typically, you won't have ulceration, though, in a lupus paniculitis, whereas with gamma delta subtypes, you can have extension all the way from uh, the sub-Q to the dermis to the epidermis causing ulceration. Lupus paniculitis often has CD123 positive plasma cytoid dendritic cells, uh, 
And this is not considered really a classic hallmark for SPTCL. And I say usually they lack clonal T cell gene rearrangements, but I know from reality that these can definitely have positive clonal rearrangements. And so nobody's going to have to rely on these um, clonal positive results. You have to take it into context. Uh, there's many reports where uh, the clinical picture definitely fits a lupus paniculitis and there's still some positive clonality. So you just have to take everything into account, especially the patient's clinical behavior. The good news is that SPTCL and lupus paniculitis, based on the literature, have been shown to respond to very similar therapeutic options. And so uh, at the end of the day, it probably doesn't matter too much in terms of impacting the treatment. But if you're dealing with a uh, gamma delta subtype, it's definitely going to be a different treatment because these patients are going to require chemotherapy. Um, they have a very low five-year survival rate. Cytophagic histiocytic paniculitis. These consist mostly of histiocytes and you usually have no clonal T cell receptor gene rearrangement as well. You have to look at the entire clinical picture with this, but you can still see bean bag cells, et cetera, within the inflammatory infiltrate. Moving on to subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. This occurs in babies in the first few weeks of life. These patients are these patients are considered healthy. Um, they're usually full term or post term babies. They develop these painless subcutaneous nodules that are symmetrical in the arms, shoulders, buttocks, cheeks, and thighs. Patients can experience some form of fetal distress, um, and these can result in the subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. So, whether it be a cord accident or meconium aspiration or preeclampsia. Etc. There's often some association with this and um, some form of fetal distress. It can be very self-limited, but the important test question for you and the important management question when you're in practice is that you have to monitor these patients' calcium levels because they can have hypercalcemia as a result of the tissue breakdown. So here's a classic example of subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. You see these crystals and lipocytes and histiocytes along with granulomatous inflammation. Keep in mind that the amount of granulomatous inflammation is important. So subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn typically has more subcutaneous inflammation compared to sclerema neonatorum, which is much more dangerous. A higher power view, just showing those intradipocyte crystals and uh, within the lipocytes and the histiocytes. So post-steroid paniculitis can look very similar to this, if not exactly the same. So if you have a test question that's showing you a picture where you see these intradipocyte crystals and they give you both the um, subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn and this, you really have to know the clinical context. Hopefully they give you low power and high power and you can look for inflammation as well, but they can look very similar. Sclerema neonatorum, on the other hand, usually you can see the crystals within the adipocytes, but you don't have as much inflammation. So not having a lot of inflammation is a bad sign. It's similar to subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, but this typically correlates with prematurity and very sick neonates. They can have sepsis. They can have underlying metabolic disease as well. Usually it affects more body surface area and it spares the palms, soles, and the genitals. And unfortunately, it's often fatal as well. So on pathology, you're going to see the crystal formation without the granulomous inflammation. Lipodermatosclerosis is known as sclerosing paniculitis. This is relatively common. You see this in middle-aged to elderly and overweight adults, more so in females than males. The patients often have a history of peripheral venous disease and obesity. You can see indurated plaques on the lower legs, which forms this inverted bottle appearance. Oftentimes it's bilateral and symmetric, and it can be associated with systemic sclerosis, but many times it's just kind of often um, standing alone. On biopsy, you see a lobular paniculitis with so-called membranous fat necrosis, this lipomembranous change, which people liken to uh, snowflakes forming on a window pane. I said that you can see this as well in lupus uh, profundus or lupus paniculitis. So uh, 
this looks different clinically than lupus paniculitis. And so uh, you have to kind of correlate with the clinical context. If you have lipodermatosclerosis, typically you won't have as many lymphoid follicles as I pointed out and emphasized in the lupus profundus. More examples of lipodermatosclerosis, really good lipomembranous change and diminution of the adipocyte architecture. Lots of hyalinization as well. You may not see as much inflammation here. So it's mostly about the, the destruction of the actual fat lobules themselves with hyalinization and lipomembranous change. Another high power view of lipomembranous change here. So how about lobular paniculitis with vasculitis? The classic one you need to know is nodular vasculitis, also known as erythema endoratum. This usually occurs in young to middle-aged women. They have painful tender nodules, plus or minus ulceration. The classic question is that these happen on the bilateral calves, typically on the posterior calf, um, or typically on the, the backside of the legs on the calves bilaterally. The frequency is higher in winter months, and it's associated with tuberculosis infection, and this is so-called Bazin, Bazin's disease. It can also be associated with acute myelogenous leukemia, as well as hep C infection, and drug reactions as well. Propothiol uracil has been implicated. So on low power, you see a lobular paniculitis, and you can also see leukocytoclastic vasculitis pattern as well. So paniculitis, lobular paniculitis with vasculitis, think of nodular vasculitis if you're not given any other clinical information. Uh, with that many neutrophils, you definitely have to think about infection too, or an infectious paniculitis. And remember, this can be a reactive infection due to tuberculosis, a reactive inflammatory pattern due to tuberculosis infection. So if you have this presentation clinically, investigate for tuberculosis. And you may do the stains uh, for mycobacteria and not see anything within the inflammatory infiltrate. Higher power showing you some giant cells as well as mixed uh, lymphocytic, maybe some scattered neutrophilic inflammation, and then around vessels. Um, it's hard to find the lumen because the vessels have been destructed by the vasculitis. Another example of some inflammation around medium vessels, kind of infiltrating the entire architecture of the lumen of the vessel, leading to uh, kind of occlusion of the lumen here. So a pretty robust vasculitis here. You may see some other areas of kind of hyalinization. Again, it's a lobular paniculitis. All right, moving on to calciphylaxis. So calciphylaxis is something you definitely need to be able to recognize clinically as well as histologically. Clinically, you see these really um, cut out, well-circumscribed kind of necrotic black plaques with reticulated edges, angled edges um, in patients that often have chronic kidney disease, the classic scenario is end-stage kidney disease. It can occur in adults and show these lividoid violaceous plaques on the lower limbs, but you can see them on the breasts, the buttocks, and the abdomen. They often ulcerate, leading to gangrene and autoamputation. This is because calcium collects within the lumen of vessels, leading to downstream ischemia of the tissue. It has a high morbidity and mortality and can result in secondary infection as well. And again, I mentioned the classic clinical scenario. In stage renal disease is when you're really going to see this present most often. On low power, you see some areas of deep purple staining kind of in between the uh, adipocytes. And then within the vessels themselves, you have collections of that calcium. Vascular thrombosis can be seen. You can see mural calcification of deep dermal and sub Q vessels and an associated mild lobular lymphohistiocytic infiltrate with overlying dermal necrosis. You can see the calcium developing within the vessels themselves. What stain are you gonna to do to prove this is calcium? You can do a von Cossa stain as well as an alizarin red stain. As we mentioned in our review of special stains in the introductory derm path lecture. Are vascular calcifications specific to calciphylaxis? No. So you can have incidental vascular calcification in peripheral vascular disease, uh, such as Monkeberg's calcification, renal insufficiency, diabetes mellitus, and nephrogenic systemic fibrosis.
Think about mixed lobular and septal paniculitis without vasculitis. So you can have external factors. Infectious paniculitis often occurs in immunosuppressed patients. You have nodules, ulcers, abscesses, and erythema nodosum like lesions. Numerous organisms can lead to infectious paniculitis, histoplasma, pseudomonas, candida, aspergillus, actinomyces, CMB, et cetera, just to name a few. You see a lobular paniculitis with lots of neutrophils. And remember, I said back in the alpha-1 antitrypsin paniculitis that you, this is definitely in your differential. Um, the patient, if the patient's immunosuppressed or you're expecting infection, you can definitely see this type of inflammatory pattern. So lobular paniculitis with lots of neutrophils. Again, you can see um, lobular paniculitis with lots of neutrophils. And then here you have these spherical objects, which look like perhaps yeast elements. So doing uh, fungal stains and fungal cultures to make sure that you're um, not seeing a disseminated uh, infectious paniculitis. And so in this case, it was cryptococcus infection. You can see, um, depending on what special stains you're using, uh, highlighting fungal elements, these ribbon-like uh, these ribbon-like uh, hyphae here, which you see in zygomycosis. This type of inflammation can look like pancreatic paniculitis as well. So remember, if you see something that looks like saponified fat, do your fungal stains and fungal cultures and make sure because the difference between treating pancreatic paniculitis versus uh, infectious disseminated zygomycosis is going to be drastically different for the patient. These patients die rapidly, if not diagnosed. Factitial fat necrosis. This is a type of uh, paniculitis or, or fat necrosis that is self-induced. It's a uh, typically presents with bizarre clinical lesions. There's often a psychiatric comorbidity to this. On biopsy, you can find foreign material with polarized light. The different causes include mechanical as well as blunt trauma, as well as chemical injections. Uh, in this case, paraffin injections into the patient. So if the patient's injecting paraffin for whatever reason, then you can actually see droplets of empty space that kind of resemble Swiss cheese. Um, they look like small little adipocytes, and then you have maybe some surrounding fibrosis in there after chronic inflammation, and then the fibrotic remodeling. Another high power view of a paraffinoma, you can also see some small kind of um, inclusions within the adipocytes here. So instead of lipophages, you can probably call them uh, paraffinoma phages or paraffin phages. Traumatic fat necrosis occurs in middle-aged to elderly females. Typically, you'll see this in large pendulous breasts in very obese patients. Also, it can occur on the arms, trunk, buttocks, and thighs. And it may be clinically mistaken for malignancy. So here you see uh, in areas affected uh, traumatic fat necrosis, you can see resulting fibrosis, atrophy, and variable inflammation as well. On higher power, you see these lipophages. And within any type of uh, paniculitis leading to atrophy, of, of the fat, at some point you're going to have lipophages absorbing the uh, all of the lipid material coming from those destructed adipocytes. You can even see a little bit of lipomembranous change in this as well. So understanding the clinical is going to be very important. Um, just on high power, you're not going to be able to say what exactly is causing this paniculitis. So you have to really correlate clinically to see, was there any kind of trauma at all? Was there any kind of mechanical stress on the tissue, et cetera? You can even have nodular cystic fat necrosis or so-called mobile encapsulated fat necrosis. This is a distinct subtype of traumatic fat necrosis, often seen in adolescent boys, middle-aged adults, women more than men, often on the legs. And you see this encapsulated nodule of necrotic or anucleate adipocytes. So here you see this encapsulation, this kind of ovoid, uh, elongated, encapsulated area of just destructed and completely um, necrotic adipocytes. You can also see some surrounding lymphohistiocytic inflammation in the tissue surrounding it. 
So this is called mobile encapsulated fat necrosis. And those are the paniculidides that we covered today. Um, I recommend delving into the textbooks to learn more. The most important thing that I will say with any paniculitis is get deep enough to actually diagnose it. So either a punch within a punch or some type of its incisional or excisional biopsy will be key to get enough fat to really say exactly what you're dealing with. Also remember biopsying for infection, doing sending for tissue cultures as well, have a low threshold to rule out um, an infectious paniculitis. Thanks for your attention.